Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Could I ask everybody to make their way into the hall, please, and find a seat? Before we uh, kick off proceedings, could I encourage everybody, if you haven't already been told to do so, to log on to the Slido uh, website on your phones. Uh, obviously, ensure they're on silent, but uh, you'll see the details behind me and on the other screens. That's to do with the interacting voting and questions that's uh, going to be involved in this session. Um, so in the next few minutes, we're making a start, but while we're doing that, if you could just uh, go on to that website, and then I think you just have to enter the future hyphen of hyphen skills hashtag. It should be quite straightforward, and you'll see some questions pop up in due course. Thank you. skilled workforce in agriculture and horticulture is one of the greatest opportunities of our time. To meet the challenge of modern farming and environmental practice, we need to invest in our people. This will ensure we maintain and attract sufficient labour with the right skills for the future. Our UK industry currently underinvests in people development compared to its competitors. We are also very fragmented in how we are organised around training, skills, continuing professional development and career routes. There's no single entry point for critical information and this impacts negatively for everyone. Employers, those currently working in the industry and potential new entrants. We need training and professional development that's geared to meeting the needs of employers. We are learning from other industries like construction that have improved their profile to new recruits and got employee and employers interested in lifelong learning and recognising the professionalism demonstrated by existing members in the industry. Key industry stakeholders are driving forward this agenda by joining forces to form the Agriculture and Horticulture Skills Leadership Group. It sees a focus on skills as key to improving agricultural productivity, sustainability and competitiveness. The NFU Next Generation the AHDB and major employers make up the Skills Leadership Group. Both DEFRA and the Food and Drink Federation have supported its work. The plan is to set up a national professional body for skills, which will become the go-to place for careers information and business support for the workforce and employers. This is a game-changing initiative designed to transform industry attitudes towards lifelong learning. If you want to help us on this journey, please get in touch. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this event. Um, I uh, chaired the senior leadership group, which has been referred to in the video until about a year ago when I handed over to Helen Woolley. And uh, it seems like some of us in this audience, the longer in the tooth, have been concerned about skills all our lives. I was saying that just earlier. This has been a lifetime mission to try and uh, resolve and sort out uh, the skills and training of the agriculture and horticultural sector. Never more so now when we face uh, the challenges of Brexit and in a very competitive employment market. So I'm delighted that we've got this session here at Oxford Farming Conference uh, to debate the issue, to hear in more detail about what's been taking place over the last couple of years or so. And um, I'm going to hand over now to um, Simon Gadd and Ollie Lee, who are part of the NFU Next Generation Group, and they're going to host this session. So, Simon, uh, you're starting off. Uh, you're going to tell everybody what this vision is for skills. Uh, it says here in a nutshell. I suspect <laughs> you're going to take a few minutes to do that because there's been quite a lot of work going on. Simon, welcome. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Don. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, joining us here today. 
Um, yeah, I'd like to give you a, a, a bit of our vision of um, where we'd like to see UK agriculture. Um, the vision we have today uh, here presents, uh, is presented from the original work started by Janet Swaddling um, from the Swaddling Report, which was commissioned by the AHDB. Um, the initial meetings we had uh, of industry representatives came together to make the Skills Leadership Group, which is who we represent here today. The aims of the group is to set up a professional body that encourages lifelong learning for all. It is vital that our industry takes on this challenge because of the impact of age demographics and the changes in quality and the availability of the workforce for our future. This is also ever more essential with the risk of falling behind other countries. We need to do this because we need to seek recognition for the professional standards we already have achieved and we will achieve in the future. And this is related to aspects of uh, productivity, of animal welfare and environmental management in efforts to become net zero. We know this is required because of the fragmentation we can already see within the industry. We must, we must uh, position ourselves to be a competitive against other industries such as construction where bodies like this already exist. And it is important that the ind industry is available to invest in the people to, the best, to get the best talent to retain to retain and train to get the best motivated staff. We aim to do this to create a single point of access for careers advice, training opportunities, and employer and employee support of existing and new entrants. In turn, we believe that the industry will be a more productive and a desirable place for work, attracting and retaining a more skilled and competent and motivated workforce. We aim to do this through creating, initially, a portal this could be a website, a phone app. Um, in the way you can see here upon the screen, it's broken down into these four key areas of careers and recruitment. So this is going to start from school so that it makes sure careers advice uh, to, to children from 16 onwards is accurate and is exciting for people to want to come to our industry and see that they have massive opportunities to have a full career and a full life in the industry. This is also to put down a career path for people to see that there is actually more places than to go to, and it doesn't mean you go to one place and you stay there for life. Uh, the employee support area. This is really important for employers and employees to create a semi kind of HR facility for people that they can come to get the right advice, to be able to help train staff and to be able to work in the industry. The learning and training area is really important, I think, for the industry as well, because so far we have no kind of recognition of CPD within the industry. A lot of work is done, but it isn't marked, it isn't recorded, and it isn't representative of the work we already do and the work we can to do to improve our productivity in the future. And the final area is the, the MySpace, which is going to be personal for each person to record and to be able to show the work they've done. And also in jobs transfers, things like this, that can show instantly how qualified they are and why people should want to employ them and why we should want to employ people. Um, from here, we're going to move on and uh, I'm going to hand over to Wally. Thank you, Simon. Um, has everybody managed to log on to Slido? Because I'm reliably informed that should all be live and active. Um, there's people uh, more capable than me that can help you if that isn't the case. Um, because just to sort of paint the picture on how we think you as in industry leaders and people involved in the industry already see the skills and training provisions on offer, we just want to ask you an initial question before we go to our panel session, and we'll revisit that later, later, uh, later on as well. So the first question is, and it should be appearing, I'm told. Uh, there we go. What one word would you use to describe the approach to training and skills in, ag in agriculture today? So just a single word. The results will be coming up live behind me as you type those words in. Um, we'll see what variety of words we might get. Uh, hopefully they're all, uh, all clean. <laughs> um, so just to reiterate, which one word would you use to describe the approach to training and skills in our agricultural industry today. So this is as of now, not looking forward with this vision in mind. Um, 
uh, there for you to see, so you don't need to make a comment too much. Fragmented is certainly one that's coming up. I should point out that the larger they are, the more frequently that word is, appear is being entered by yourselves. So you can see the bigger words are obviously at the forefront of the majority of people's minds as they're coming up. Um, I would probably say, looking at it at the moment, is that it's not a clear picture. We've got fragmented, inconsistent, there's quite a lot of negative words there coming through, which is probably what all of us involved in this whole ambition um, you know, have similar concerns as well and similar views. Uh, I think it will be live for just a few more moments, but I think it's given us a really good picture, actually, those of us that work uh, on this work, as to uh, how you see it as well. Um, probably negative as a whole, I would say. Uh, work to be done which uh, reiterates probably what Lord Curry has said right at the beginning. Um, so that's useful data, I think. All of this data, incidentally, will be collected and held by us um, to, to reference to. Uh, we've done this similar exercise amongst our group that's been working on this. And just on the hoof, it looks like the words coming out are very similar to what we thought. So I appreciate that. Really useful, useful feedback. And as I say, we'll revisit the feelings of the room later on. Over to Simon. Um, so I'd just like to introduce our three panellists we've got on the stage with us. We have uh, John Charles Jones here, who's here today to represent the kind of small to medium farmer, the uh, small number of employees. We have um, Karen uh, Holton here with us, who is here to represent uh, kind of somebody returning to agriculture or new to agriculture. And uh, we have John Shropshire here today, who's here to represent the, the larger employers in the industry. Um, they're going to help to kind of flesh out questions with us of how um, the work we're doing and how this professional body could uh, help the different areas of the industry we see that it can. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, John Charles on the end, if you can just give a little bit of introduction to him so, about himself. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Simon. Sorry, forgive me if I squint a bit. The lights are actually quite bright in the front here. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I'm, I used to call myself a new entrant. I'm, I suppose, a now first-generation farmer, albeit probably in the twilight of my career. Um, I've climbed pretty well every step of the farming ladder from assistant herdsman, herd manager, farm manager, contract farmer, and then we ended up unexpectedly buying our own farm uh, 15 years ago in uh, Nottinghamshire. Um, I think I would say during the course of my career I've been very lucky and, but I think the one thing that I would say is that uh, learning has significantly increased the chances of me being able to make that luck happen more often. Um, I mean, learn, learning for me comes in a variety of um, ways where it can be informal, it can be peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, so not only do I learn from my own mistakes, but I can learn hopefully from other people's. And then there is more formal um, education as well, and having started with an HND in agricultural science, I think one of the best things I ever did was taking a year out, age 49, and did an MBA, and that really did focus my mind. Um, so, uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, can we go to Karen now? Hello, everybody. Um, I spent previously to coming into the agricultural industry, I spent 14 years as a director of a legal recruitment consultancy, um, predominantly based in London, and then I set three offices up in Birmingham, Manchester, and Leeds, and ran those for 14 years. So that's sort of a different industry I've come from with a different approach. 10 years ago, I married a dairy farmer um, and became a dairy farmer. Uh, came home to work, so I gave up my career and, and started a new career. Uh, we farm in Cheshire, we milk 530 crossbred cows, um, got 300 followers. I have, uh, probably including Tom and myself, my husband, there's 14 of us in our team, um, which that would include somebody who probably comes um, day release from college or just does a few night milkings, but they're still a massive part of my team. Um, we train quite a lot, so we invest in our people quite a lot, but we do that ourselves. Um, in my old industry, that was just the norm, and um, so I brought that to our industry. 14 people might sound a lot, but I look at an approach that I want more people working less hours. So we work a very high welfare system. Um, 
although it's quite a high input system, it's very, very high animal welfare. That's what we pride ourselves on. And we win a lot of awards for that. Um, but we actually treat our people the same as well. So we have high people welfare. That's me. Thank you very much. And then, uh, John, if you'd like to. Yeah, I'm, <coughs> I, I'm from a family farming and fresh produce business that was founded by my father. Um, we're now moving in the succession going into the uh, third generation as we've got three sons and a daughter coming into the business or well, already in the business. We operate in several countries in Europe and uh, in Africa. We employ over 8,000 people and half of those are seasonal workers for the harvest of the salads and vegetables of which we produce about 1 billion packs per year. We have a team-based structure that operates 24-7 year-round, supplying the retailers and non-retailers alike throughout Europe. My father always taught me that the most important people in the business are the people that do the actual work, and that includes the professional management team that, that manage them. And I believe that there's too much status attached to the ownership of land and businesses, and not enough recognition of the professionalism in the industry and the actual farmers and professional managers and, and staff that work in it. Getting down to basics, we heard earlier um, fr from Simon about the construction industry. The construction industry in the last 20 years have reduced fatalities by 85% in their industry, and yet we are still suffering the same amount of issues with safety of our people. So that's the absolute basics, but we've got every other aspect of running a business right through from that to business success and financial success. Great, thank you. Uh, great introductions there. Um, I must point out that, that John Shropshire has been quite involved for, for many years now in this uh, ambition, this project. So you're probably slightly more knowledgeable <coughs> than, than the other two panellists who have had a very brief briefing, uh, probably <laughs> the last day or two, about the work we've been doing. So um, we're going to try and keep this session a, a bit two-way, really, because I think they've got lots of questions yeah. they'd like to challenge Simon and I and, and the rest of us in the group with as well. Um, so I probably ought to ask really, any, any questions first off, John, Charles Jones, um, about what we're trying to do? Yes, I mean, I think, I think really uh, what, what I didn't say in my introduction is that um, being, being self-employed and we have no, no em employees. So how, how do you think the vision is going to impact on, on farmers, if you like, at the smaller end of the scale um, that might not have any employees and be, be seeking re-employment elsewhere. Yeah, as, as a lot of the industry, you know, you're very representative of a lot of the industry, aren't you? Mm. you um, I think that the main drive we have for a lot of this is a, a push for productivity. And so this affects every single farm throughout the UK. And so this drive is that we can bring together a better training aspect for anybody. It doesn't matter if you're on a small farm, employing a lot of people, um, you can always lock into this and always find new ways of improving your personal business. And, and it's about self-improvement. This is all, all about helping people to help themselves to, to be able to do better. And so this works from every single man, from every small farm to John here who employs 8,000 people. It will be able to help his staff as well as helping you. And I think we like to think as well, it might link to opportunities in the future for succession within your business, whether it's in the family or beyond the family. You know, if there is career recognition for people that want to enter the industry are, or are already in the industry as well, maybe, you know, provide more of a structured framework for that as well, John. Um, John, Dropshire, you must yeah. have some, some thoughts with all your work you put into this project. Well, how do we get more recognition for the professionalism in the industry? I think that is the driving force behind this. How do we encourage the brightest and best people into the industry? And how do we train and develop them? And how do we meet the demands of the future? You know, we're going to have a very challenging future in agriculture. And I think it's a good time to be in agriculture because there's going to be a lot of change. And the farmers that adapt to that and are trained and professional will be the, the ones that succeed. Mm. Yep. I, th I think we do this through a structured yeah. and agile process that we have a, a framework that people can see and can work within. <clears throat> And so we do this by creating competency trees where people can see routes and career paths through the industry where they can come in at any point, any stage from school level through to 
um, post-university thinking about what they're going to do, or it could be people, say, coming out of the army, they're a very good man management, um, but don't know anything about the industry yet, but have ways that they can learn and train up and be able to move into the industry. And it, it, we're not looking for just our agricultural skills. There are the whole of the host of skills that people need in job roles that we're not focusing on right now that I think we're definitely going to need in the future. Yeah, I think so. And I think it's widely accepted or known by everybody in the industry that we're not attracting enough different people into the industry. Um, new entrants, first generation farmers, I'm one of them. Um, I've got a brother who's a, uh, an engineer. You know, the, the way civil engineers and, and mechanical engineers are structured, they very much have a career path beyond college, beyond university. It's an attractive career path. If you don't have any other family or friends that are in that industry already, I think there's a big gap in agriculture, and I'm sure you agree, John, that, that we haven't got that framework for career and professional progression as you go through your career. So I think it's desperately needed. Karen. Yeah, you've kind of sort of answered part of my question. I mean, I'm just really passionate about bringing new blood and younger blood into the industry, um, especially the younger blood I think we need, um, and, and sort of promoting those people and developing them. Um, it's not just always about a piece of paper and a qualification, it's about emotionally developing in people as well. Is that something that you could help me with? Uh, yeah, I definitely think so. Um, as, we, as we're looking at starting from kind of the age of 16 and making sure that, um, that agriculture is recognised as a STEM subject um, and that everything is involved in science, technology, maths and engineering and that from the early age we can get people interested in this and also start to show them there's a, a world outside of cities and that actually being outdoors is great for, the, great for people mm -hmm. and that there are career paths there that yeah. can keep you there and can be exciting for your future and engaging and make want people to stay and come to the industry. Can I just ask you, Karen, because you're slightly different to the rest of us here and that you um, were heavily involved in... in, in, uh, in uh, say that. Uh, I better be careful what I say. Uh, in people, recruitment, HR, you had some you know, pretty interesting positions prior to entering the agricultural industry, so you must have a view on skills and training. How, how do you see it, having not been in the, in the industry and now in it, in terms of how we train, treat people, manage um, workforces? Um, politely, we're very behind. We're years behind. So there's some practices that go on that, that I know went on a, in, in our farming business before I came home that would be deemed normal. That If I'd have done that in London, I'd have had my backside sued off. You just don't treat people like that. There's mm. some, you know, but that was just a culture thing, and it's you know, been a culture from a long time ago. But as the generations come through, it does change, I think, and we are becoming far more aware um, of how to do it. And it just makes sense to me that if you, you, put, if you invest in people, you will get something back. Yeah, yeah, I think it's becoming more and more accepted, and mm. let's hope it continues. Uh, John, do you have another point? The I mean, I, I suppose I feel that, that, that time, time is always difficult, especially for um, you know, somebody who's perhaps not employing anyone. So I, but having said that, I recognize the value of learning. I think the one, one thing that perhaps, I wouldn't say concerns me, but I think um, the industry should be aware to is that, do you not feel that with the government wanting to um, uh, improve productivity, competitiveness, and sustainability, that um, any element of CPD recognition could become compulsory rather than voluntary as one, as one looks to the future? Um, uh, good question, Simon, do you want to? Um, I think the focus of this, I still will say, is, is all about productivity, is all about making the best of everything we can and getting on the front foot, because if we're not careful, um, we will get left behind. And so unless we're there pushing and driving for the best for ourselves. Uh, pl pl please don't misunderstand me. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely with you and those who, who do the learning and the training, then they will position their businesses ahead of the game. Um, I accept that. But I suppose it's the, it's the element of possible compulsion to, to do it, especially if there's any public funding coming from government in the future, whether they may link that in with a requirement for learning, I mean, it would be very easy for them to do. Need to carry on, yeah. Um, there are a lot of fears in the industry, there have been for years, 
John and I sit on National Council, the NFU, and we often hear this with um, assured standards and, and sprayer and pesticide standards and things like that. Um, we are in a world surrounded by requirements already. Um, we certainly don't see any of the work in this project slipping down the slope of something that becomes mandatory or anything like that. Apart from anything else, we're not really proposing a single uh, you know, issue um, or a single requirement or single level. It's going to be something that um, perhaps could be phased in right from school leaver age all the way through to, to very experienced farm manager, business operators. You know, we're looking at a type of uh, recognition at all sorts of levels. So I think <coughs> it would be hard to make something compulsory that doesn't have a single level or benchmark. So um, it's going to be a very much uh, industry-led, staged approach. Um, so I really don't think um, you, you need to have any fears or the industry needs to have any fears in terms of something becoming mandatory, a compulsory requirement be it to get public support, public funding, etc. Um, and we probably ought to add, a, a part of our group, our wider group, who I'll introduce later on, does include government, um, Department for Education, DEFRA, amongst others as well. Um, you know, never once has it become a topic that this will become compulsory for the industry. John, did you have any comments on that, really, in terms of you know, the regulatory requirements of standards like this for skills and training? I think if we, if we don't you know, really get our house in order, then inevitably regulations will be imposed on us. So I think this is about us getting on the front foot. And I think that um, there's always a danger there's going to be more regulation because we've got environmental issues. We talked earlier about aiming to get to net zero, um, or Simon did, you know, animal welfare issues. All these issues, are the, the, there's a possibility there's going to be more and more regulation. But, and to actually be frightened of actually you know, going, getting out on the front foot to train and develop ourselves and the whole industry and everybody in it to the required level to meet the challenges of the future is really just not the right approach, really. We've mm. got to get out there on the front foot, I think. Yeah, and I think, as we've all alluded to, we can learn a lot from other industries as well. Yeah. You, you both mentioned yeah. the construction industry. There are other industries with different charterships and other different types of um, career recognition. Um, you know, it would be slightly backwards of an industry, in my opinion, to sort of push that away. So, mm. OK. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so now this, this is the moment where we say, so you've heard a bit about more what we're, we're talking about. Um, you as the audience, you're the people this will be affecting, you're the people that will be have an influence on this. Um, do you have any views on this? Any, any questions you'd like to ask us about it at all? <laughs> Deadly silence. I've got one over on the side. OK. I think there's microphones coming round. I do believe you can use Slido as well to ask questions, so if you'd rather not stand up publicly, I think it can um, appear magically behind us. So do type some questions in. Just just picking up really on your point of regulation and mandatory training, we're already in a position where we've got so much mandatory training we have to do through assurance schemes, as you say. But the problem, as we are, for example, I'm a mixed farm, and we have poultry passport, we had pipe with the pigs, we have PA1s, PA2s, and everything else, and, and keeping up with all our neuroso. It's very, very disjointed and duplicated in terms of how we already do this. And I think it's a really great opportunity to bring it all under one roof and try and reduce the amount of, of course we do and try and bring it together. And I'm just wondering how far you're getting with talking to the, the necessary bodies to try and bring it together and, and whether there is an appetite for doing this to try and try and reduce the actual workload that we have to do in terms of training because duplication is probably one of the most frustrating things that we have to deal with as an industry, especially as a, as a mixed farm. Uh, yeah, this is absolutely the kind of thing we'd like to reduce because, you know, the, the whole thing we're talking about productivity is not sitting in an office writing over and over again the same kind of forms that you're going to hand out to different people because it's a slightly differently worded question. We, we need to be reducing that kind of time and actually focusing the most amount of time on making the farm more productive. And actually, if it's animal welfare you're working on, you need to be working on animal welfare, not filling in forms to hand out to people. Um, uh, it'd be worth pointing out, we are, as, as, a wide, as wide as the project is, we are talking to nearly every organisation you can imagine of in our industry. All the skills providers, the colleges, the trainers, uh, AHDB and all the levy boards, obviously NFU. So, you know, it's a, it's a massive collective thing. It's quite hard at times getting everyone's opinions together, but uh, all existing bodies are involved and, and behind this, actually, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I can see people have got some questions coming up here about the, the recognition and accreditation of skills. 
Um, these kind of things haven't been worked out yet. We're still in the early stages here. Um, but yes, there will need to be some sort of level there that, because all this work can be to nothing if it's not recognised as a, as a physical standard. So there will need to be something in there that uh, there is a body that will be recognised as an accredited form that will, uh, will make sure that the work we do, the CPD we collect, things like this, actually is worth more than the paper it's written on. Okay. Shall we bring um, John Shropshire? Uh, it's, it's quite a large employer. Do you currently find it difficult to distinguish between um, potential employees in terms of you know, their career path, their history, what level they're at in their agricultural career, probably talking more management level, I imagine, in your business, but would this be useful, you know, having something that you can pair people with? Well, absolutely. Any, any um, pathway, in, no matter what level we're operating to, because I think this is really important for the farmer who doesn't actually employ anybody right the way through to being chief executive of a big operation. You know, we're wanting to be all inclusive of this and it provides a pathway. And I think as an employer, we would be able to, you know, um, understand that in terms of um, how anybody's CV looks and, you know, potentially get their, um, get a really good understanding of what their contribution could be in the company, in the business, and how well they'd fit into the team. Mm -hmm. uh, just to follow on, actually, we, yeah. um, as the next gen, we recently had a trip to, to G's, and um, we saw some really interesting work of actually CPD going on um, in the workplace. It was around um, some broccoli, and it was uh, uh, some staff being trained on monitoring of um, the type of stuff that's collected. How could it help you? Because this is the type of thing we're talking about, that the, the people like you are already doing CPD. And how can you see an accreditation helping uh, with you? Would it help your staff? Is, is that the type of thing that you're looking to achieve for your staff, that they recognise the work they're doing, as well as yourselves in training them? <coughs> Anything that gives them a vision of where they can be in the future and helps them progress their careers to whatever limit that might be. Some people are very happy just to work at one level, other people want to keep going right through. If they can see a career pathway and can see a training and development program that's an enabler for that. And actually one thing that I think is, you know, some farmers are scared, well, if I train somebody, they're going to go and leave. Well, you know, if we've got a, I, I actually, I quite, in one way, somebody leaves, you know, you're actually contributing to the industry as a whole. And we've got to work together as an industry as a whole to be successful. You know, G's could do a lot of this stuff on its own. We're big enough. But actually, we don't want to be an island in, in a country of, uh, that, where the agriculture is not thriving. We want a thriving industry as a whole. So people moving around the industry has got to be seen as a good thing. And that might be quite difficult for some farmers to, to handle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I had seen the question coming about um, funding earlier as well, and um, this is definitely something we're very much talking about. Um, we're looking initially for um, a government pump priming to get this set up and get running. Um, but then on, we're looking for a, a really mixed model, um, whether this is a membership, whether this is um, grants to keep it funding, um, any different way at the minute is uh, we are inviting in to talk about this because there is no set model on how something like this runs at the minute at all. Yeah, and I think and there's a question come up there about um, would DEFRA consider linking productivity grants to purchasing new machinery or technology? Well, probably a question for DEFRA, really. Yeah. But um, <laughs> certainly, I think our view is that if the industry, either on a business level or, or pan-industry level, can demonstrate greater productivity and, and therefore with it more sustainability, which is quite an important topic at the moment, then you know, it may lead to... Um, gaining more credibility to access public funding for other things. We're not saying it's a requirement, but it's going to make the, no, the industry... No, but through more, more productive. sustainability, through more productivity, you can actually start to work towards net zero and things like this, and this is going to be the public money for public goods. It's a way of demonstrating it, that we can do this, and how we've achieved it, and uh, the future is going to be about KPIs, and so it's about demonstrable results from what we can do, and how can we can demonstrate it. So we think something like this will be able to show people that we have done work, we are worthy of it. 
Yeah, and just going back to the government thing, because that's popping up, uh, we, we are actively involved every single meeting, which is monthly uh, or every other month in person amongst our core working group. Uh, we generally have at least one, if not two, government um, civil servants there. We have met the Secretary of State or the previous Secretary of State um, a couple of times mm -hmm. in the course of this project in the last 12 uh, months or so. Um, government are very much supportive yeah. of this across this various departments. Yeah, this isn't just DEFRA as well, this is um, Department for Education as well who are very keen to work with us on this because they're looking at how we can, uh, how we can develop there as well. Mm -hmm. Karen, just sorry, coming back to you, you mentioned your staff at your dairy farm. A similar question really to, to John Shropshire. Do you see in say five years if your potential employees came to you and they have had a standardised way of demonstrating their experience, the level they've got to in the industry, etc. Would that help you in recruiting? As long as that met with my qualities or standards, yeah. What I don't want is something that's half a standard of what I do myself. So don't bring me something that isn't as good as what I already do with my people. Yeah. That's what would be the key for me. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that, because I do recruit a lot from outside of our industry, because I like fresh blood and mm -hmm. fresh meat. So I can train and develop people how I want them to work at my standard. Um, how would you advertise that outside of our industry? How would you help me to encourage those kind of people in that aren't already agricultural people? Mm -hmm. That would be my question. No, no, you don't. Yeah, so... Well, there's various ways that spring to mind initially. I'm sure Simon will chip in. But first of all, um, obviously online is a, is a very powerful tool. We've looked at other industries. We're continuing to look at other industries. Uh, methods of recruiting beyond their own. We've mentioned the military already. They're very effective at um, recruitment and they have recruitment campaigns online, social media. Um, similarly, the construction industry, which we're often compared to, they've had the similar challenges to agriculture in the last couple of decades, not least on health and safety, but in recruitment as well and shortage of skilled people. Um, Go Construct is a very good website that um, we often refer to in our meetings. Is there somewhere um, we could sort, sort of start sooner than that? Could we start in schools? Yep. Maybe? We do could do a bit more there? Yeah, so this is going to start with careers and training and at the very early stages and showing people an option and showing them a careers path. Um, this will start with a competency framework so people can actually see job boards that can kind of access within the industry and actually what is available. And so yes, this definitely has to start very early on. Um, just from kind of work that we do with NFU, there's kind of very early stuff to do mm -hmm. like with farm bench and in primary schools, which getting people to think a bit wider and think that, yes, it may be engineering, but actually engineering plays a big role in agriculture. Yeah. And so it's not just thinking that because it's one thing, it's not another. Agriculture is wide spanning and covers a lot of areas. And so it's getting think, people to think out of the box a little bit more. And we need to make the industry look attractive as it, as it is. As we find it attractive to be in, we need to demonstrate this to other people that this is a good place to be and an exciting and enjoyable career to have. Definitely, especially on the technology side. It is, it is the future, and so we yeah. need to be recruited. This is the other thing as well, that the, the, the numbers of people that we're lacking in the industry is ever, gro is ever growing. And so we need to be recruiting the right people for the future because technology is changing rapidly and we need to get the right people to make sure that we're on the front foot with this technology. There's an important point, the, the, the last question that's just come up about recognising um, the skills and training that's already happened on farm and happening in businesses. Um, this whole project, this ambition and vision isn't about um, now looking forward, it's about the historic ability of people as well. Um, and so probably if I, if I dare come to John Charles Jones, someone in his position that doesn't employ anyone but has got a huge amount of experience and, and you know, life qualification, shall we say. We're very much hoping any future framework would still apply to them. Similarly, people maybe in their 30s or 40s, farm managers, business operators as well, you know, they're not starting from zero. They're immediately because of their experience and historic training qualifications and skills, um, you know, get a level of accreditation. <coughs> that, that's sort of what we're working to. So it's by no means just for um, college, school leavers onwards, it's for everybody across our industry. It's to start with a blanket statement to, that we need to recognise that we are a professional industry and the work we do is professional and it to be recognised as that and as John's actually gone wider afield doing an, M an MBA and things like this are completely different but it actually brought him back to see that the work he was going to do 
wasn't worth it. And actually, agriculture is the better route for him to go through. And he, he was, uh, well, would you like to talk a bit more about this, John? It's better. I mean, it was, uh, yes, it was a, a bit of sort of crisis management at the time, really. We'd, we'd, we'd lost our business through no fault of our own. So I decided that um, agriculture was not for me anymore. Um, so I went to do a, a, an MBA in wine business management, of all things. And I think it very quickly taught me that actually all the um, problems that we think beset the agricultural industry beset all industries. And the grass is always looking a bit greener on the other side of the fence when actually it isn't necessarily the case. So it was almost a case of, of coming back to what I felt were my core strengths and experiences. But certainly the whole training principle, I mean, it was the first time in my life when I'd actually spent you know, a concerted amount of time looking at a simple thing like a SWOT analysis. You know, how, how many times do we actually do that, either with our staff or ourselves? You know, and I think, um, you know, I would hope that the Institute doesn't try and do too much too quickly, and some, you know, we just need to perhaps concentrate on some really core, you know, simple stuff in a way. Yeah, this, us all think this is about what we're talking about, focus on the basics and get it right from yeah. the start, and get a good recognition of the work we do already. And it brings you back to the simple questions and the simple answers that this is probably the right question, but you're just not asking it quite right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, any final points from the panel? I think quite a bit of research has been done in what other countries do, and I think that we're well behind. We know we're behind in Northern Europe in terms of the amount of training development we do. But we've been around Canada, Ireland, New Zealand, Australia. All these countries have a better framework for training and development skills than we do. And I think we can learn a lot from them as well. Yeah, this is absolutely true. There's a, the New Zealand one. I've got a, a new competency framework that they're working with now. Uh, America is the same. And mm. There's plenty of other countries that are actually already doing this. So we're not the first, but we certainly don't need to be the last. And I think you're absolutely right. We're, we need to get on top of this, especially with the new political and world climate we're moving into, we need to be demonstrating how we are the right people to be doing agriculture in the UK and supplying food for people in the UK and shipping this abroad as well. Um, because no one else is going to, no one else is going to give it. We need to demonstrate how we are the right people. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I've got. I think that's very valid. That last point there that's just moved now um, about people that maybe get this accreditation. Is there any ongoing follow-up to that, or do you just get an accreditation, or you get to a certain level and then that's it? Is there any further work to be done? Because you know things change so quickly, and in this in, in my industry in dairy, it changes all the time. The stuff we were doing two years ago that now is old hat. We've learned new, better ways, and we've changed again. <coughs> so it's we're always changing. Luckily, we're not scared of that. Um, but I think people can get a qualification and go and do the job. Five years, nobody's ever gone back and revisited that. And things have changed in that period. Would there be a, what would you call it, a backup service or a... No, this is all about CPD, a, isn't it? It's that, it's that, right, continu so it, it's that continual it professional development. Because, as you say, everything changes so quickly. If you don't keep up with it, it will leave you behind. Mm. This is why we're working with um, universities. So we have David Llewellyn down here with us today, who's in the senior leadership group from Harper Adams. Um, it's working with them and because we're going to be going back to the universities and things like this to get the right information and get the most up-to-date information. So everything we do is the most up-to-date and we are doing the best job we can. Um, but I think it, yeah, it, is, it is going to be continual professional development. Because you say that the work even two years ago is already old hat and there are better new ways of doing it today which can help everybody. I think, uh, and the key to point out at the moment, the framework of how we sort of model this recognition amongst all levels, you know, throughout the, your career, whatever age you are, um, it, it's still very much in draft form. So, but I think the, the opinion amongst all of us working in the group is that we will have certain levels, benchmarks of recognition in terms of where you are in your career in the industry. And that will also be linked to CPD and ongoing development as well at that level, or if you want to go up a level. And it's going to be both, both you know, academic based, so you can get to the level through academia, but you can also get through it to it through you know, on-farm experience and work. Mm -hmm. So that it's going to be sort of open to, to most career paths, we hope, within our industry. Mm -hmm. I see there's a highly liked question at the top there about um, providers. I assume this is around training providers. Um, yes, so far, universities especially are starting to work together a lot more now um, about the, um, what 
David recently uh, hosted was it a, a joint. You know, actually, Dave, do you want to talk about this a little bit more? If you get a microphone to Dave, it's probably best to come from you, really. Okay, I, I think actually the question might have been um, something more around other other bodies within the within the um, agricultural industry. But uh, as far as educational providers go, there are various organisations that bring them together. What we want is better joining up with industry to know what you want at the end of the day. And if we can achieve that through this initiative, through creating a professional body that has a set of competencies that run along each, each uh, role within the industry uh, and has a solid CBD framework that it wants to see put in place, then the providers, I think, will be better informed about what you need. And then we can think also about the future and offer you things that you might not be thinking about that would be valuable in terms of shaping your businesses or adopting new technology and so on. So the agricultural <coughs> universities have come together in an agricultural universities council. Uh, Landex is the body that uh, brings together the FE sector uh, plus other specialist institutions in agriculture. Both are represented in the work of the senior leadership group in this initiative. So there's plenty of connection going on here, I think. Uh, more connection is needed, obviously, as we develop the framework and we begin to look at what that means for accreditation of qualifications in the future. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I think that probably draws to a conclusion the, the panel session. Thank you. Sorry we couldn't go through every single question, um, but there will be chances at the end and later on to ask any of uh, those of us involved in the project. Just to return for the final few minutes, we'll go to a few more live uh, polls, if that's okay. Um, <coughs> I'm hoping they will, the questions will appear any minute now on the screen. It's really, again, this is very much a two-way session, so we're wanting to be challenged in questions on this whole project, the whole vision. Uh, it's got to be representative of what our industry wants, so it is important. The feedback we get uh, you know, will be taken away. It's not just for uh, the here and now during this session. So there's another question on there using your Slido um, um, apps. Can you answer that, please? What one word describes how you would like people and businesses within our industry to be viewed? So this is how would you like other people to view our industry going forward? It's more aspirational, I suppose you'd say. Again, the more commonly typed in word amongst the room now will be coming up larger, so it's quite interesting. Um, slightly more positive angle to what's coming through. Professionals and interesting uh, word, we've had lots of debate in all of our meetings about that terminology. Uh, to some people that can be quite frightening, to others um, they say we're already professional, we are a professional industry. Um, so it's a bit subjective professional, but I think I probably know what people are getting at. Uh, progressive, innovative, skilled, sustainable, these are all uh, quite welcome words I would have thought. Um, and certainly things that came to mind when we were sort of modelling the development of this project and indeed it still continues now. Uh, quite useful words coming around the outside as well but professional still sits there <laughs> loud and proud in the centre, progressive, forward thinking, innovative, skilled. Uh, you know, very much hope all those words also lead to um, more productive and let's face it profitable businesses as well. So. Um, really useful and we will actually capture this. I should say it's all anonymous, so you can put what word you want up here. We can't trace it back to you uh, either, but that's, uh, that's really interesting. Fun's good as well, I like fun. If, if uh, employees and people working in a business are having fun, generally they're more productive as well. Uh, so thank you for that. We'll just go on to the final question. Um, this is slightly nerve-wracking, I suppose, for, for those of us that put uh, hundreds of hours of uh, time into this project. Um, hopefully that will come up now. So do you think this vision should be taken forward? Um, I don't know if that's just one vote or whether everybody's, everybody's had a go. Um, but please do. There we go. You can see the count going up in the corner now. It's looking quite positive so far. A few uh, happy colleagues in the room that are involved in this project. Um, I hope you appreciate that it's very early days still. Although it's been going on for several years, it's a, it's a big task to undertake. As I say, we've got pan-industry support. Everybody's pushing in the right direction. We are listening to industry, listening to farm businesses as well. Um, my role within the NFU, you know, NFU members are heavily linked to this. We've, uh, we've been talking to all of the NFU members as well. 
uh, and all the other organisations. So at the moment, that's looking quite positive amongst this room, which is generally the feedback we're getting uh, you know, out and about as well. So 97% out of 65 votes in here at the moment. Might be a few more of you that could vote, so please do continue. Looking like the vision should be taken forward. So that is really helpful. Of course, the feedback doesn't end here. Um, lots of us are, are in the room and around Oxford today who are involved, fully involved in this project. It's not just Simon and I. In fact, there's many more doing a lot more than we do behind the scenes. Um, there are flyers as well, I believe, near the, the exits today that give you a, a, where to find out more information about what we're doing here. We're welcoming more people on board uh, with their uh, expertise and thoughts on the whole movement as well. Could I ask um, those of you within the senior leadership group um, to just stand up if I could, and those in the subgroups as well. It might just show those of you that aren't involved how many people are involved in this project from all the different organisations. And we've all been given a little orange spot on our name tags, um, and hopefully everyone's got one. Um, <laughs> If you haven't, they'll soon have one. Uh, so if you see any of us with this orange dot in the corridors at the coffee break, etc., please, we really want feedback and we want to discuss this more. We want your thoughts because it's only going to work if the, if the industry as a whole is behind this whole initiative. Um, so with no further ado, could I ask Lord Curry to come up and give a final few words on the project? Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> can I thank you both for the way in which you've led this past hour? It's been, been great. The responses that you've given, ladies and gentlemen, are a great encouragement, I think, because they demonstrate a deep concern about our industry and uh, a deep affection and commitment to the agricultural and horticultural sector, which we're all part of and which we all love and we want it to succeed. We want to be proud of having a professional industry that's recognized for the excellent work it does. And that's, I think, come through in the responses that you've given. Timing is everything. And uh, as I said at the beginning, it seems like all my life we've been talking about this and wanting to project ourselves as an attractive career option to students, to those in schools, uh, to those in colleges, and to uh, attract and retain the best quality staff that we can. Uh, and I've been talking about this all my life. It seems to me that uh, through the work of the senior leadership group, we're reaching a point when it just needs to happen. Uh, 2020 is a crucial year for a whole variety of reasons, not least because we're leaving the European Union and a, a brave new world, an uncertain world awaits uh, out there which we need to grasp and be part of, whether it's competing here in Britain uh, against other industries for skilled people. This is going to be a real challenge for us with the issues that we face. Uh, or whether we're competing in global markets against other competitors. We absolutely have to have a workforce, people leading our industry who are up for that challenge and able to uh, respond and compete. Uh, we need, as has been said already, to uh, improve our productivity. We need to reach zero rate emissions. Uh, we need to uh, improve and uh, uh, restore biodiversity. We need to respond to all of these challenges. To do that needs a skilled workforce in a global world which is going to be ever more competitive, in my view. What hasn't been said but was, was inferred is that only by having people who are able to access new science and new knowledge relating to the investment that's been made in science, in knowledge transfer, will we be able to actually deliver these aims and ambitions of ours. The world of robotics, of AI, it requires skills which I don't have, but which uh, the next generation of people who are going to lead our industry definitely need to have in the use of data. We have coming along a new agriculture bill, a new environment bill, and these are going to shape the future of our sectors and uh, be an influence in terms of, uh, of how government will see the role that we need to play. And the NFU and others in this room 
uh, including myself, uh, want to try and make sure these bills are what we want. They're going to deliver uh, the structure that will be crucial to the future of our industry. And I keep coming back to this. In the past, we've looked to government uh, for support and leadership and direction. Actually, we in this room need to take ownership of our own future, our own direction. We need to make sure that government's agenda matches our agenda and our ambitions. And so we have a responsibility, I think, to set the tone to actually help identify and create the vision that we want for our industry. And having a skilled workforce to do that is absolutely crucial. Questions about <coughs> funding, about could this become a legislative requirement are very legitimate questions in my view. And uh, I can see a time when uh, being able to access certain grants may require a given level of qualification. Why wouldn't you, as a government, demand that you can demonstrate that you've got the qualities within uh, your business to be able to deliver uh, the results of the funding, the outcomes that the funding will be targeted to deliver? <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, if I were a landowner in two or three years' time, why wouldn't I want to let my land to a tenant who could demonstrate that they've got the qualifications necessary to manage that land professionally and compete in the marketplace. So I hope, I hope the market will deliver uh, the need for qualified workforce rather than legislation. But I think John's absolutely right. If we don't demonstrate we're on the case, then we will find ourselves uh, on the back end of legislation if we haven't voluntarily uh, uh, delivered a program to demonstrate that we have ownership and we're able to do it ourselves. Uh, I, uh, AHDB have been extremely helpful and generous in their funding of this initiative to date. Uh, and I do hope that that might continue without putting any pressure on Jane and her colleagues. I think it would be good if AHDB were to continue help through this formation stage. But I also think government needs to help with the funding of this. They've done it for other sectors. They've given a commitment in their manifesto to support the development of skills. So we need to put pressure on DEFRA, Department of Education, uh, the BASE, to actually help us get this initiative up and running on the ground, which I'm sure in due course could be self-sustaining. But the formation stage is going to be critical, and I think to have a shared responsibility from industry with HDB and government, on the other hand, to get this initiative running would be really great. I think um, the questions that have been posed that we may not have had a chance to answer, I'm sure the SLG, the Senior Leadership Group, will be looking at those questions because we need to be able to answer those questions. There will be lots more uh, questions that you will have in this audience that haven't been posed yet. Please, let's have them because we need to be able to respond uh, to ensure that we have absolute support from the full agricultural and horticultural sectors, not just the organizations, but all those of you of indi as individuals who have uh, some influence and are leaders of our industry. I just want to close by thanking a number of people and organizations. Uh, HDB, I've thanked already. Uh, Jane, we're very grateful for all your help and support. And Peter, if he's here. Um, Judith Batchelor of Sainsbury's. Judith has also been really helpful in funding some business planning work which was done uh, by PwC, which was really grateful for. Uh, NFU, very grateful guy and the team for your ongoing support. John uh, Shropshire of G's and your support. John's been really helpful. Richard Longstaff, Longthorpe's here, who's also been really helpful through the AgriSkills uh, Forum and uh, the charitable fund that Richard's established there. So, and all those who are members of the Senior Leadership Group have all given lots of time to this. Um, so, as I said at the beginning of this clo these closing comments, ladies and gentlemen, the time is now. You know, we really can't mess about any longer. 2020 needs to see the maturing of this initiative with the establishment of this new body 
and uh, bringing the industry behind it all. I think we've got uh, stakeholder groups planned sometime later this year, right in saying that, I think, Janet and Jane, uh, where we will engage further on progress, but we really need to make this happen. And ladies and gentlemen, we need your support to do it. So thank you very much indeed for coming. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Lord Curry, very much. Um, you, you've been pretty instrumental in this as well yourself, getting everybody together. So uh, we're, we're very grateful. Just before we wrap up, if there is further discussion that you want to have with any of us that have stood up or stood up here, and you are dashing off to the Sainsbury's event now, um, many of us will be around in the East School at 3 o'clock to have more debate and discussion. So please do keep those questions and uh, challenges uh, as much as you want. So we look forward to seeing you there. Could you just join me in thanking the panel for spending time coming today? Thank you. Thank you.